All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode one of the College Dodgeball Podcast. My name is Kevin Bailey. I am Director of Marketing for the National Collegiate Dodgeball Association, and today I am joined by uh, a name that is known very well in dodgeball, and that would be Wes Peters, coach of multiple teams in the NCDA and also uh, a recent winner of an NDA tournament as well with East Lansing Final Justice. So welcome to the podcast, Wes. Hey, Kevin. Hey, Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, so let's just uh, jump right into it. What we're going to talk about today, the college dodgeball season just started. We've got the Buckeye opener that just happened. We're going to recap that. Uh, from there, we're going to talk. We're going to pick your brain a little bit as being a, a coach of both Northern Kentucky and then Cincinnati. I'd love to hear your input on on recruiting and and retention and, and how all of that uh, has gone for you and also just your, your tips and tricks for that that any listeners might want to know. And then from there, we'll even jump into some talk about uh, the National Dodgeball Association wrapping up its first season. You're on the board for that. Um, so yeah, I'm excited for this discussion. But first off, Buckeye opener. How do you think it went overall? And then let's let's hear your takes on on the two teams that you coached. Sure. Yeah. No. I I thought it was a really good tournament. Um, timeline wise, we ran a little behind, but not too bad. That's par for the course for an NCDA tournament. Um, definitely. But no, the action was great. I mean, almost every single game was super close, except for basically the games NKU and CSU were in for the most part. Although that specific game with those two teams was very close. Um, Shout out to my Norse getting their first W in their first ever match. Yep. Um, let's see, my other, they went one and two on the day. UC, my other team went, I guess I should say my first team. They'll get mad at me if they hear that and I say they're the other team. <laughs> but they went two and one. Uh, OSU was the talk of the tournament, though. Them and Kent State both going three and zero. Um, Kent, maybe an easier schedule, but stomped Ohio into the ground five to one, I think, five zero, five two, something like that. I can't remember. Super five impressive one. for them, five one. That's what I thought. Yeah, it was. yeah five one. Um, super impressive result. Braden Stevens caught every ball that was ever even thrown remotely his direction. I was told he didn't drop a single ball. So that kid might be one of the best guys in the league right now. Um, but Kent. Full squad and then some, it looked like, to the tournament. So pretty pumped that they're back, frankly. Um, and I'm kind of hopping around here a bit. But LSU also going 3 now. Host team, favored team to win nationals coming into the year by the preseason power ranking. Um, looked a little iffy against us in the first match. But, you know, they've only been practicing for a few weeks like most teams. And um, they have 10 returners, but... You know, it's that first match of the season. They're getting the jitters out and breaking in for the Yeah. Those kinds of games in these first tournaments can be a bit wonky in that regard. The talent that they have and that they brought to the tournament and, and get a feel for their strategy. But overall, pretty awesome tournament. Like I said, almost every game was competitive. So it was really good. Especially in part one, is really good footage, great feedback. So, great day of the yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah, I mean, my biggest takeaway when I looked at the results, I was only able to watch a little bit of the tournament. I saw some of the Ohio State Cincinnati game. That was the game I was most excited to, to see personally. But um, my take, my first takeaway was, is Kent State back? That's really, I mean, I think that there's a lot of people in the league right now that don't realize that back in the day, back in our day, mm -hmm. it was really the, like, they were the best team in Ohio. They were the standard for dodgeball in Ohio region. So it would be awesome for the league if Kent State truly was back. I just, it's hard to tell yet because of the opponents that they played, Ohio being the best team they played, and they had a horrible showing, obviously. Mm -hmm. I, I'm really itching to see Kent State against one of those top teams, and I know I've had conversations with other people, and they've said the same thing. I want to see them against Ohio State or Cincinnati or, you know, one of the top Michigan teams, whatever it might be. So what is your take um, on a 1 to 10 scale? Is Kent State back? Where are they at? Kent State is. I would say I 
I think they're still a year away from true contention. I, I think, like I said earlier, first tournament, you know, figuring things out. Penn State came ready to play, obviously. I don't want to take anything away from them going 3-0 and and, like I said, stomping Ohio. But their schedule was super easy. They played CSU and NKU, two low of the low rung teams. And then so they were pretty well unrested going into Ohio, their, I think, third match of the day. Um, meanwhile, Ohio went through the ringer playing UC and OSU. Um, right. So that, I, I mean, grain of salt with that, it, the rest thing has to be a factor there for sure. But that being said, you know, every, like OSU, Ohio, UC all had tough schedules. Akron, um, and, and those teams all had pretty good results except for Ohio. So I, I'd say Penn State to circle back and land the plane. They're about a seven. I think they're a year away still, or maybe just a semester. I don't know. They had a lot of returners this season, a lot of catchers. I, I just, I haven't gotten to really watch a full match of them. And then, like you said, I'm interested to see them play a full slate of like three really good teams like, like Ohio did in that, in a yeah. day. So. Yeah. Maybe the only slight regret on the scheduling with, with the featured court is yeah. that we can get Kent State on it, but that's you know, we, in know. Respect, we didn't know what we were going to get. Yeah. No. no, I mean, go ahead. I think they're, I think they're back. It, it's fair to say they're back. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're a good team, but yeah, they're, let's just pump the brakes a little bit on the Kent hype. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and just see how they do with their next tournament. Okay. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, moving on to some of the other teams, though. I mean, it's interesting just to look at the scores and, mm -hmm. and kind of gauge the parity in the Ohio region, which there's been so much of in the past. Um, maybe Cincinnati was, was kind of a step above a little bit over the last couple of years. But this year, Ohio State, they're the number one team of the country, mm -hmm. according to the power rankings. And then, I mean, they had to go to overtime against Cincy. And then from there, Cincy went to overtime against Ohio. And we right. know what happened right. with Ohio and Kent State dominated Ohio. So when you look at all those all those results kind of overlapping, it makes you think, is is the Ohio region super deep? Is it is there so much parity in the league as a whole? Or kind of where are we compared to last year at this time? What are your takes on that? I, I think it's fair to say OSU is definitely the best team in the in the region right now. Um mm -hmm. I, I don't think that's like any sort of wild take or like whatever. Yeah. Um, after a rocky start against us in their first match going to overtime, they walked right through their next two opponents. Like those next two matches weren't really, really close. Um, you know, five to two over Ohio and four over Akron, not close games, never in doubt. So I, I think they definitely improved throughout the day and show they're the best team in the region currently. Will that change throughout the year? Who knows? Um, I to say for UC, um, we brought eight rookies on our roster, and we had four to five on the court at any given time, and then four to five sophomores on the court that were most right. of them breaking into new like roles as primary ball handlers for for like the first time, besides Will Hyatt and and Ski, obviously. So a lot of growing pains on our end. I, I'm confident we're the second best team in the in the region right now. Um, but I, I don't think it's by a wide margin. Like we, we definitely we went over time against Ohio. We narrowly escaped against Akron. Like those are two good teams, despite Ohio's results against Penn State. There's five, maybe six. I, I want to see BG play because um, they they had a good result against Akron, losing only three to two. I want to see them play some other, you know, higher tier teams as well. I, I didn't get to see much of BG other than when they played NKU. So yeah. I think I think it goes OSU, and then maybe a little bit of a gap right now, and then the like next four to five teams are all very close together. Yeah, Bowling Green's a good. That's a good point as well. With them, a point or two away from going undefeated on the day as well. Maybe that'd be the lead off of this conversation. I mean, they were they went two and one, and their loss was like you said, three to two to Akron, who is a solid team as we all know. Um, okay, awesome. Let's talk about. I just want to hear your uh, opinion on who some of the top performers were at the tournament, and then we'll jump into some of that recruiting stuff. Um, so, yeah, sure. what, are, what are your thoughts? I know you mentioned a few guys on Cincy, 
Uh, and then mm-hmm. Stevens, I think, from Kent State. But yeah, yeah. Just because I know how many kills he had, uh, Matt Rosinski for UC, he would really mm-hmm. put the team on his back and carry them. He had fifty-three kills. We've watched the tape, and yeah, he had fifty-three kills with his team. Not counting the overtime. Just like an absurd number of kills in three games, and it's deep how good he is, but also like how hard he, hard he had to work to pick up the slack for the rest of the team that I mentioned getting used to new positions and going to the first one. But beyond that, I would say Nick Kemmer, great performance. Kids have done abuse. He won rookie of the year for a good reason last year. Brayden Stevens for Kent State. I'm the shot for an AKU player, TJ Gilkey. Uh, he's a baseball player through and through. He's like chasing this baseball dream. So I hope he, look, yeah, I hope he uh, quits that soon and just commits to dodgeball full time because <laughs> he's, uh, he's a great dodgeball player already. I took him to an NBA tournament after he'd been practicing only for like two weeks. Um, and he played on the Lake Monsters and he, he held his own. Obviously, green as grass, but big yeah. arm, super athletic. Um, but yeah, great player. Let's see who else, uh, Max Steckel for, for Ohio. And I was impressed by Sean O'Donnell as well. Um, both players, I think play on the right side for them. At least they did when we played them, um, big arms, great do it all players. Uh, Logan Knapp was killing us on the rush. I know that. Um, yeah, those, those are the standouts from, from what I saw. I, I didn't get to watch much of CSU, um, or BG. Um, I'm sure Evan Brown did well. Oh yeah, for Akron. Um, PJ played had a really great game. Alexa Schultz played well. She got some solid kills. Um, <laughs> Akron looked very balanced across the board. I'll say that. Like uh, a lot of a lot of good talent, but a very good like well fitting together team. They're well coached. Um, but it's the normal standouts right now from what I saw, you know, breaking in freshmen and, and newer players. So, yeah, Of course. And it's, it's early. You're not going to get those. You're not going to have those uh, rookie players that you're throwing out their names yet. It's the first tournament of the season. We're going to, those, those players are starting to yeah. you know, get their couple tournaments. There is, there is one rookie that I would shout out. I forgot his name off the top of my head, but it, uh, Guy for Ohio, just absolute cannon of an arm. Like, um, he was the hardest throwing player in the gym that day, and he's really? a rookie. Yeah, or I think he's a freshman. He's a rookie, so um, he was wearing number seven. I, I don't know his name off the top of my head, but he he was a monster. He was scary to stand behind, stand in front of. I'm sure for a lot of players. So I like that. Okay, yeah. we'll get his name soon. I'm sure that we'll yep. get his name in response to this uh, podcast. So that's. That's good to hear. Um, and that really transitions us right into the next thing. Let's talk a little bit about recruiting and or retention. Um, recruiting season is basically over at this point. It's it's uh, late September, but you've gone through quite a bit of it, especially with new teams. So you've got a better perspective on this um, than probably a lot of people. I just want to hear your opinions on how it's gone. And honestly, this year as a whole, just Looking at that first tournament, do you see a lot of new talent on different teams, or where is that going uh, from a league as a whole standpoint? It's it's, it's tough because I, I don't know like every team who's a rookie who's not obviously, but huh. like I, I I can just speak from like a UC and NKU perspective specifically. Um, we had a lot of holes to fill on UC, and obviously NKU being a brand new team, like just need people. Um, my number one tip for NKU. Um, anybody and everybody is welcome and that goes for any club can use that advice but especially when you're starting a brand new club you just need people who are like happy and like want to play dodgeball no matter what their skill level is you need to build that foundation before you can even think about being picky like obviously you want to like talk more to the the kids who stand out to make sure that they stay but like you, you got to it's a full court press when you're starting a new club. You got to hang flyers. You got to go to whatever student uh, organization like sponsored events that your school offers, and you need to do every single thing you can when you're starting a new club. I had the advantage of 
finding our captain Will uh, Will Strong from his high school baseball coach. So there's a, there's a tip right there. Reach out to your local baseball programs <laughs> in high school. Oh yeah. Um, that are nearby you to tangent off that and jump to UC. Um, we've got a little bit of a Lakewood High School pipeline going at UC. Um, thank you, Terrence. Check it uh, for giving us Will Hyatt. And now Will's got us our an, a standout rookie for us, Colin McCrone. Um, year younger than Will, freshman at UC, went to Lakewood High School. So if you've got a pipeline, ask your players what high school they went to, if they played high school baseball. And go back to your high school, talk to your coach, talk to seniors that are soon to graduate, see where they're going, pick those kids up. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, I mean, it, recruiting it always has to just be, like, your number one goal for the first, like, month of the season, right? Like, obviously, there's your fall recruiting fair, and you need to be all hands on deck at that. Like, speaking from for UC's perspective, um, we have like 10 to 12 people show up to our recruiting fair to help out. Like we have people walking around the fair with flyers in their hands, handing them out to people and saying like, Hey, our, our, go, go to the UC booth, go sign up. Um, we had two laptops going at once to collect names for a freshman, um, names, email and phone number, email and phone number. Super important. I found, um, cause you can send out those, you know, mass email blasts. Just make sure you blind copy people so that it, looks like they're the only one receiving it and it's not like a hundred plus people on one big email chain and it just it's clear it's a mass email blast um and then obviously hound them by texting them directly like um split that up texting individually is a hassle but at least you can copy and paste the same message and hit uh change the name there but texting and emailing super important to get people to come to that first practice and then getting them in your, your group chat, whether that's Discord, group me, whatever it might be, um, get them in your group chat as soon as possible. And then even once they're in that, keep texting them for the first like three to four practices to make sure that they know when practices that night um, and that they keep coming for the first couple of weeks. If they make it through the first like two to three weeks of practice and they're still there, they're more, more likely to stick around for the long haul. Big time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that all makes complete sense. And then, like, honestly, to add on to that, I think it goes past the first month of, year, of the year in that you really want to get a tournament where you can get those players actual playing yeah. time. So I've talked about a lot, but the B team thing, if you can get an event where B teams are, are competing, that's going to – any team that brings a B team to that event is at a huge advantage, and it's just – an absolute cheat code for your club yeah. to be able to have yeah. that sort of depth. And we don't see many clubs these days that possess that sort of depth. Part of that is um, a result of the new uh, 12 on 12, which isn't new anymore. It's been around for a little while, but smaller clubs. But if you can, if you can get that depth and keep all of those players in, mm -hmm. the best way to do that is to keep them happy by actually getting them playing time. And yeah. there's not always going to be playing time to hand out on the top roster on the varsity roster so b team tournaments or even if they can just show up and play a couple games against other uh, official teams because those do count as official matches now yeah. Um, yeah all of that's super important too so getting them to stick around for those first three weeks but then on top of that keep those players happy keep mm -hmm. them engaged um and i think that that's the phase that we're in now for the next month or two um mm -hmm where you've got to really keep those players engaged and they're going to be coming back for the winter semester after that. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Like you said, it, it, just speaking from like UC and NKU's experience for UC, we brought eight to the tournament last weekend on our roster, eight freshmen. It was a struggle to get them all playing time because we were in such oh. tight matches, right? It sucked. I felt so bad for, for some of the kids that I, I just like, I, they weren't quite ready to be in prime time yet, but I wanted to get them experience. Um, so it, it felt kind of bad, but like we brought them and then we had a couple extra kids come too. So like, even if you can't bring a B team and like, you only have limited spots on your roster, I would encourage people to invite those extra kids who, um, freshmen who don't make the roster to come and travel with you to the that's tournament huge. as well and make them feel like they're a part of the team. Um, yeah, that's I think huge. we had two 
two or three guys come and, and just watch the tournament and support who were freshmen and didn't make the first roster. Um, wow. Okay. And then, uh, contrary to what some people might believe, getting, if you're a brand new team, playing your first matches as soon as possible, as soon as you think they're the least bit, you know where I went with that, uh, the least bit ready uh, is paramount. Like, with NKU, we'd only been practicing for, like, four weeks. But, like, that experience was invaluable. Like, the first match, they happened to win it against CSU. It was amazing, and I'm super proud of them. But, like, results or not, like, they progressed so much as, like, individual skill as a team, like, figuring out what they should be doing on the court so much by playing real matches. Whereas yeah. if we're playing 6v6 or 7v7 at practice, like, it's it's night and day. You can't, it's not comparable, like, the type of experience and atmosphere that it, that a real matches give you. Um, and now they're all hooked, right? Like, I've already asked them if they want to go to UC's tournament that we're doing in a few weeks, like, and I've already got more yeses from kids that I wouldn't have originally thought would want to go to a tournament or go to a second tournament. And they're all about it already. Like after like one day of matches, like yeah, that's that's crazy. Early playing time is super important, whether it's freshmen on an established team or or every player on a brand new team. The sooner you can get matches in. Um, shout out to the Southern schools, UNG, GSU, and uh, Ole Miss, getting early matches soon as well. That's going to help all those teams tremendously. Yeah, that is big and. Yeah, shout out to Ole Miss as well, being a new team. Um, we'll see if their first match is as successful as, as NKU because coming out 1-0 and in your yeah. very first yeah. event, and then uh, obviously they lost games to some other teams that um, they were overmatched and that's expected. But winning a game in your first tournament is, is wild and that um, yeah. is reserved to only a handful of teams that are – you know, very good in their it first year. Jamie, you get it. Entire season to win our first match. We didn't win it right. until nationals. Yeah, yeah. So I had a schedule, um, and that's exciting. And congrats on that win. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah. Any other any other thoughts on recruiting, or should we uh, cap this off with with some uh, talk about the NDA slash state of dodgeball as a whole? Just one last thing I want to add in. If you guys can invest in a radar gun um, for your career or career fair, for your recruiting fair in the fall and just keep it and use it whenever, um, that's another thing that UC uses. We intentionally get a table near a wall if, if you can. I know a lot of groups are outside, so like you might have to like buy some like pop-up netting um, or something that you can keep balls confined into to throw at. Okay. But that radar gun does wonders for us every single year. It's it, like... So important for getting kids engaged and showing them how to throw and, and wanting to think like, oh, dodgeball is like a real thing and a real competitive sport that I can play. And you get them to the first practice and they see it is real and boom, they're they're hooked, right? So invest oh, yeah. in the radar gun. Yeah, that's huge. That, that reminds me too. This is one of the things I always say is if if your club is is promoting itself, you know, as a as a fun thing or you know, you all hang out, party together, whatever it might be, that's not going to bring in the type of player that you want if you yeah. want to be a successful team, as opposed to if your intro to the club initially is about how it's a serious sport, you're, you're taking it serious, you have practices, all of that, um, and you want to win. And on yeah. top of that, like the radar gun thing, that's just going to draw in, that's going to draw in the people that, are going to make your club more successful. It's going to, it's going to draw in those better athletes and all of that. So yeah, that's another cheat code. And I'm sure there's many other tips we could go on for hours, but let's yeah. get into the last subject of this. I want to hear from you being someone that has been so involved, NCDA, NDA, coaching teams, all of that. Um, State of dodgeball as a whole, what are your thoughts on it, where it's going compared to where it's been in the past, all of that. Let's hear it. Yeah, I think uh, even just comparing to like coming out of COVID two years ago or whatever, like the leagues are both in a great place. Like I'm so happy we started the NDA to, to start there. Um, our first season has been just beyond successful. I don't think any of us on the, the executive board expected the turnout we've gotten. No, like 20 teams. Something like the unique teams. Like that's nuts. Absolutely nuts. 
eight mm-hmm. tournaments, eight different champions, the parody, like, oh my god, like three years ago, like or four years ago before COVID, it was it was Dynasty Kraken and Notorious or Omerta. Like and those were like really the only pinch teams that had a chance of ever winning a tournament. And when it came to nationals, it was really Kraken or Dynasty. So like the parody there and in who knows I'm partial obviously coming off my our win with final justice the last tournament but like who knows who's gonna win nationals like it, it is very up in the air it could be another brand new team it could be omerta or gamecocks or uh, a team who's won a tournament already this year it's it's nuts um and playing nda is only gonna make you by the way as an ncda player that much better coming back for um for your sophomore season if you're a freshman playing the, the summer after your freshman year um, oh yeah it's it's great um but not to belabor that point too much um state of dodgeball and cda is in a great spot too like shout out to ryan ginsburg taking over as director of league expansion he's going to do a much better job than i did a much better job than lusky did like he's going <laughs> to best chair yet and i'm super pumped for him to be in that role he's already off to a hot start you guys are off to a hot start with brand new clubs like nku Ole Miss. Uh, UW Wisconsin Stout, I guess, has a club that's going to be starting soon. That's going to be huge for the Central Region. Yeah. Um, UIUC coming into like their first full season as a club. Like, it's only up from there. Uh, Stony Brook hopefully hopping in soon. Um, we're in a great spot to, to keep growing. And I know the Southern, the Georgia teams coming back. Like, we're only going to keep expanding and growing as a league. Um, and soon nationals is going to be at a point where we have to cap it. And I'm super excited for the league, hopefully in the next like five years to get to a point where it's necessary to do that. Um, it's a good problem. Yeah. It's a great problem to have. It's like recruiting too many good kids, right? Like and making cuts, like it sucks, but it's, it's a great problem to have versus the alternative. So, um, I couldn't be happier and more excited for the future of the sport of dodgeball and where we're going. Yeah, well said. Um, yeah, the NDA, the first season, uh, exceeded all of our expectations. It really did. And the only way that that was possible to happen was if all of these people stepped up and, and produced teams. And the interesting thing about the NDA compared to a lot of these other um, post-college leagues is is that these teams are unique teams. It's not like there's all of this overlap. So there, when we say there's 22 teams, there was 22 teams. And yep. each of those teams is up to 12 players on, that are rostered with them. So the numbers are, are way better than we expected. Even, I mean, going back, I know you remember this in 2021 when we, or 2020 yeah. maybe. It was. Yeah, it was 2021 when we were experimenting. Yeah. Yeah. Our, that first event, and I think it was in... Eastland. Was it East thing? Yeah. yeah. And there was like three or f- there was the four teams or whatever it was. And it just felt like, man, are we stuck with just this small group of good pinch teams in, in yeah. this version of the sport? We know it's the best version of the sport, but it's so small right now, it seems. Fast forward to where we're at in an awesome place. And I can almost guarantee that there's going to be some new teams next year that pop up that those conversations are probably already ha- being had oh, in these all, different You know how it is. They definitely well, are. Like, oh, yeah. we're going to so, get anything for sure. Yeah, and more more college players getting involved earlier in yep. their careers, which that's a trend that we didn't see that much of, and it's it's taking over now. And I think next year is really where we're going to see a lot more um, of that happen. But, yeah, very pumped about that. Um, and I echo all your thoughts on just – State of dodgeball as a whole, um, we're in the right, we're in a good spot, and the trajectory is really what what is makes it exciting, yeah. and we're yeah. heading in the right direction. So, um, with that, right before we end here, I want to get one last uh, take out of you. What's your predicted final four for NDA, and what's your predicted final four for the NCDA, and who's the champion of each of those? Let's hear it. All right, on the spot, huh? Okay, NDA, I'll say Final Justice. I have to. Um, no. Kraken, Omerta, and... Hmm. Give me... 
Give me Frostbite. No, 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 no. Mutiny. Give me Mutiny. Yeah, Mutiny. Oof. Despite losing Corey Heitman, uh, they're still a super strong club. That That's how, how tough it is to pick four. Like, I, I almost picked Frostbite. I, I could have picked Spartans, like Gamecocks, Dynasty. Um, so much parity in the league. Um, let's see. NCDA, though. I think OSU will be there. MSU will be there. Uh, ben Smart's playing Grand Valley's probably there. So that leaves one more spot. Um, Jamie, you could easily make it, but I have to be a homer and pick UC. So. Yep, fair enough. Um, and then who's going to win? Too easy. I'm going to say Final Justice and UC. Okay. Oh, man, that would be an absolute disaster for everyone else besides you. Besides and I hope that doesn't happen uh, for that case. But that being said, best of luck. Yeah, Wes no Peterson, uh, this podcast, very good info. Everyone that heard the recruiting tips, actually take them and take action on it, please. Um, and yeah, very pumped for the rest of the NCDA season and NDA as well. But thank you for hopping on. Um, we appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me, Kevin. Thanks, guys.